Hello, uh, this is a practice talk for what I'm going to be giving at the AI Engineers World Fair, which was tomorrow at the time of recording. We'll see when I actually release this. It accompanies the blog post that I released on Wednesday, June 4th, um, very closely. And this started as me wanting to come up with a way to understand where we've been in the last six months of RLVR and where we're going. And it really landed on some ideas that I found very useful for my thinking about particularly the agents that are coming out of big labs and the things that people are trying to build with these reasoning models and kind of how we think about things that reasoning models can do and what they're going to be able to do. Also, I'm experimenting with the Google Slides recording feature. So hopefully this works out well. I normally use different software. If you don't like this, I, I won't do it in the future. So let's get into it. To start, I don't need to tell everybody about reasoning models. Everybody has them. Everybody knows that reasoning models kind of have two key components. One is large scale reinforced learning training that scales up and that elicits a new thing called inference time scaling or test time compute. Um, the real questions are what are we getting out of them besides high benchmarks? What will we get out of them in terms of products? And what are the next frontiers for training them? I think a lot of people spend time understanding what we'll do with these models, but don't understand the processes that are so challenging in terms of actually pushing the models to these new capabilities in the future. I like to say that the, or the, there's just a lot of use cases where these reasoning models are unlocking things that I actually use on a day-to-day -day basis. Here's an example that I'll start with, which is O3 finding an extremely niche um, piece of media, so a GIF for me, and getting a direct download link for it where a week or two before I was writing a blog post on over-optimization and RL again, or actually I think I was writing the RLHF book part on it, and I had tried to find this. And O3 found it in less than 10x the time, and it gave me the download link to get it directly. It's just like such a perfect interaction with AI that was using this O3 model that was really touted as a math and code model again, but the search abilities really felt totally different. So reasoning is really starting to do these new things like here's the famous gif a lot of people that have followed reinforced learning for a long time have seen it where this boat is over optimizing the game score and this kind of abilities are is used in something like deep research as a screenshot of gemini um, claude code is something that i enjoy playing with i call it kind of interactive code agents i use it a lot for building websites and certain things that aren't my like core technical day research job and also codex these fully autonomous code agents that are starting to come into the world where um, they don't necessarily work for my use cases, which are like GPU heavy or need a lot of internet access. I haven't tried it since I got internet access and so on. But there are a lot of people that are using this to make substantial technical progress on their jobs from their phone and just from a chat interface. And the key thing is that there's going to be a lot more of these as these kind of abilities of reasoning models shift. And I think the key thing is that people are now building reasoning models as an autonomy focused entity. Before reasoning models were really an unlock of kind of math and code and these, this what I will call a basic skill of reasoning. And now that we have that, the scope of ambition is far higher, higher. So this plot from Meter showing the log increase in um, task length in time that AI models can do um, versus release date has gone around a lot in the last few weeks. And you can see that I would say the models were starting to plateau as GPT-40 was coming. And then as reasoning became a thing and this reinforced learning with verifiable rewards, we got a new boost in time horizon and kind of consistency on what I would just call this HNG robustness and doing a lot of tasks over time. I think gains on this chart aren't free. They're the result of a lot of hard work, mostly in data and some in algorithms. And what we are doing is scoping the sorts of things we will focus these curation efforts and these training efforts on in order to unlock the next generation of AI models. So my kind of whole argument is that reading models as they become better at planning will push this boundary. And I'll explain what I mean by this. So the core question of the talk is like, how do we train a reasoning model that can work autonomously for 10 times longer? How do we act like what type of things as a research director would you need to think about to solve and what skills are these models going to have or what traits are these models going to have to actually do this? So what reasoning models need to act as an independent agents can kind of be broken down into a few what I call traits. 
The first one is skills. We needed models that were better than the autoregressive like GPT-4 models at solving really hard tasks. I call this a skill as the ability to solve self-contained problems. In many ways, the reasoning models already have this. Reasoning models are fantastic at being trained to solve really narrow tasks when we collect the data on it. The next thing, especially for products and when we're going to be spending a lot on inference, is that the models need to understand the difficulty of problems themselves and not overthink. I'll talk about how this is currently handled by the user, but it needs to become native to the models. The strat strategy, models need to be able to choose the right high-level plan. Because a lot of this work is autoregressive and just forward-facing, the model is going to lose so much if it starts in the wrong direction and it often won't be able to um, correct itself. And then finally, abstraction, where as the task becomes so big, the model itself needs to break it down into pieces that it can actually solve. And there needs to not be any kind of human intervention in this. So to kind of summarize, I would say that like we've largely done the skills component, which is, I'll show you the benchmarks, the scores are crazy. There's a lot of research on calibration, but the users don't yet have it. And then strategy and abstraction are what are referred to as planning, which is really at the forefront of people discussing what AI models can and cannot do. To review, it's good to look at this reinforced learning from verifiable rewards loop. I think when you're actually training these models, there's a lot of complexity that can go into it. But at, high, at the high level, this is a reinforced learning loop where we have some training data that is prompts or problem settings, and we pass them to an agent, which is a language model. The agent takes actions in the forms of completion tokens, generated tokens, and then those generated tokens are checked versus various ground truth rewards. There's Python packages for things like math. There's much more complicated sandbox environments for things like code. And the complexity of these environments is only going to get even higher. And it'll turn into a multi-turn. I think it's you can update this feedback loop to work in a multi-turn setting where there can be multi-turn credit assignment or just multiple actions in an actual environment um, until the answer is obtained. I think this, this picture is particularly good for the, the um, kind of math or code single turn diagrams, but it's we're quickly progressing outside of that. So I think that most people here don't need to recap all of this, but it's important grounding for any reasoning talk to just remember how much progress we have made on these skills when it comes to massive leaps and benchmarks that were supposed to be at the frontier of performance. So here I have Humanity's Last Exam, um, Amy, GPQA Diamond, MMMU. So this is kind of like knowledge, math, knowledge, and multimodal reasoning. And if we look at the difference between GPT-4O's kind of later versions, and then what O1's announced scores were, it's a massive leap on these. And then O3, which was um, a scaled up version of RL with 10x the compute, largely on, this, on the same base model as O1, the performance and gains are again massive. And now as O4 is supposedly shifting to a new base model and even more scaled up RL, you can expect the raw skills of this model to be so high. So it's like we know that reasoning models unlocked huge increase in benchmark scores with things like inference time scaling, better math and code performance, I think on a per token basis, and just more reliable tool use. And that has totally transformed the way that these models can act in the world. And we're going to keep getting more skills as we level up the models. But we th these skills we can already do so much with. So we kind of have to think about like we have these models, and now how do we turn them into these agent agentic models? Um, I would definitely, I think that it's very easy for people to get frustrated with the reasoning models. I, you, you open ChatGPT right now and um, the effort to calibrate which model you need to use or how much inference time scaling you need to use is ver through various user interventions like model selectors, reasoning on off buttons. Um, soon it seems like reasoning effort selectors and soon the models, I think especially like OpenAI has marketed this with GPT-5 is that the models are just going to know how to route the tasks themselves and how hard to think. And this is a huge product and kind of efficiency gain to help mitigate rabbit holes and help increase robustness on tasks. There are a few examples of things that we've seen in the first half of this year is just like these reasoning models will spend hundreds of tokens on things that should be completed in 10 to 100 tokens. And there's just no... Um, diversity in how long there's diversity in how long the responses are but it, it's really lagging in terms of what should be reality and an example on the right is that like quen's reasoning model uses often between 10 and 100 times the tokens of the underlying instruct model on math and code pro like 
there's just this massive increase in token spend, and we just need to make sure that we're doing it proportional to the actual problems at hand. As we get this calibration to be improved, it's going to be a lot easier to solve a lot of these later planning problems. So I call some, the subset of planning strategy, which is reasoning models that go in the right direction and kind of can do this themselves. Right now, reasoning models will normally just dive right into a problem, at least those we can see the um, reasoning chain on. And reasoning agents like Claude Code and those that I've showed are prompted to first create a plan of attack before actually doing it. This is kind of like deep research asks you a question before you press go. And over time, I think the models need to be able to do this on their own if they're going to be able to be these autonomous agents that we actually want. So on the right is an example where I wanted to check this, so I asked DeepSea Garwan one of the prob example problems on the Frontier Math website, and it just dove right into the problem. It didn't say like, oh, I'm going to plan out how I do this, what I need to do. It just kind of went right in. And going in the right direction just really avoids a lot of traps where because these are autoregressive models, it's they're making forward progress all the time. We, these verification steps that the reasoning models have and backtracking are actually much more minor than revisiting a plan from scratch. So I think if you think about it in the word, it's like backtracking, verification, these skills that reasoning models have, they're not restarting from scratch. This first plan in direction is gonna be very crucial. And I kind of attribute this to why sometimes things like deep research either are a masterpiece or a dud. And it goes down to like, did the model get the crux of the question or answer right from the outset? And if not, there's kind of no saving it. So this is why this is such an important thing. It kind of feels like how artful the model is in understanding user requests and understanding what it can build. The biggest compliment to strategy is gonna be kind of abstraction. So there's a lot of questions on how we should design a language model that orchestrates and acts on its own plans. There's a lot of implementation things, such as like how should a language model manage its memory? How can a language model avoid repeating the same mistake? How can a language model make sure it breaks down a plan into parts it can solve on its own? How can a language model offload more thinking to the harder subtasks? How can a language model orchestrate multiple workers on subtasks in parallel? I think in the world we're going, all of these are going to be doable by the model itself. So we need to think about how to set up domains where we can study each of these mm -hmm. and we can look at a strategy or a planning document given from a model and give it feedback and kind of do this training mechanism. And in many ways, we hear all these stories of QSTAR being trained to with a substantial manual curation effort and in order to get these first reasoning trains. And I think that Reasoning was especially like a really buried capability in the internet pre-training. But because these reasoning models are already decent at planning when prompted to do so, we kind of have a platform to make synthetic data where we can train planning in. And we need to kind of do this data curation effort to get these initial planning abilities to be very good. And so like a future deep seek style model will plan before acting. And potentially even with different tokens. So right, like right now we have this think and think token. We could have a plan and plan and then a, a think and think. And this would mirror a lot of work done where rubrics are now used for LLM as a judge. And it's just kind of like, instead of just jumping into reasoning and answer, we're going to have the model generate context, then reasoning, then answer. And I just think this is a natural way to work as the, the questions get far more complicated. So if we revisit this last this example that I gave um, with O3 finding something, the right way to think about this is that O3 is very skillful at search, but it doesn't have the kind of planning and abstraction abilities to do tasks that are a bit broader. So O3, when there's a niche piece of information out there in the world, it can go very deep and it can find it. But if you ask it something that kind of requires synthesis or a broader survey, it doesn't have the planning and abstraction to kind of map out the survey and then do each of the small points one after another in order to actually get it done. So if we kind of revisit this, this is the four tasks that we need to do. There's a lot more that you need to fold into here. For example, parallel compute isn't really mentioned in here and parallel compute is an important thing to reasoning models. We can add this parallel compute to make it so that the models um, 
can be more robust in like the final answer. We've seen that a lot of what makes reasoning work is these kind of rare tokens. And if we're doing some sort of reward model generation or self-consistency, this kind of surprising tokens won't occur as common because robustness is kind of different. It's the opposite of exploration. It's really exploiting to get the right answer. And things like this, where between memory management and parallel compute, um, will operate in parallel of us making these underlying models much better. And this kind of posits like, can we actually make this future happen where reinforced learning is the focal point of language model development? Um, I'm talking about, about the underlying modeling to make kind of a final checkpoint. And there's an open research question on what is described as continual learning, where if we have these RL reasoning models interacting with the world on really complex tasks, can they keep learning from more environments when this training signal is just so expensive to generate all the inference? Like, can that actually work? I think it's just good to visualize what this future could look like. And we're going to kind of start battling through these technical questions in the next couple of years. So we all know that we've already trained on more or less the whole internet and RL training is growing very fast. And this is kind of what I was mentioning. And if we look at the kind of deep seek compute profile for V3 and R1, the deep seek V3 paper showed that post training used about 0.18% of the compute. They used almost no compute on post training the first V3 and the pre-training took less than two months. Um, there is a now deleted tweet from a deep seek researcher that said RL training for R1 took a quote few weeks. I think we have to take it into the grain of salt that their infrastructure is probably getting better, their RL training is going up. But if you assume that the RL training was on the full cluster, it probably wasn't, DeepSeq R1 could already be 10 to 20% of compute in GPU hours. Um, I suspect this is higher for the new version of R1 0528. Um, I've heard rumors that OpenAI is seeing kind of compute parity as being a real thing for their future O series of models where instead of like 90% and like 3% retreat training and post-training compute, the future models would be something like 60% pre-training and 40% post-training. And this goes to show that if, this is before continual learning is really unlocked. And if this continual learning can work, it really paints a picture where post-training is just the majority of training compute for these models. And this all comes down to the models having better planning abilities and being able to be trained on these harder tasks. And it's very exciting to kind of see, I bet we see early signs of this within the end of the year and 2026 is going to be where a lot of these prototypes become super valuable products that everybody uses. So thanks for listening. And I hope you're around to help discuss and, and build some of these models. Thanks.